we, we're very lucky to have with us Maureen Dillon, who is the National Trust Advisor on Lighting. And uh, she was kind enough to give, to give some very interesting observations when she visited the chapel, gosh. Last year. Last year, I was going to say, it's quite a time, time ago now. So, please, oh. thank you very much. Thank you. Um, this is, um, I'd like to thank uh, Sastia Mark Jensen for providing myself with a copy of this page from an inventory of um, 1659, and I'll be referring to that later. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, before I start looking at the inventory, I thought I'd just make some general remarks about lighting, the history of lighting, and in that context, to put the chapel lighting into context. Um, I'm going to start with a quote. Um, As much was known about interior lighting by the Greeks and Romans as was known in 1750. Discuss. Um, in fact, that's what would be more accurate would be to say 1783, because this was the invention of the Argand lamp, a single lamp that could produce light equivalent to 10 candle power. And for, for millennium, there had been no advances in lighting. And so um, when we're looking at um, Peter House Chapel, we're looking at um, a building lit by candles. The most important form of lighting, really up until mid to the end of the 19th century, was the light provided by the half fire. All other lighting was supplementary. It was only with the new inventions in gas lighting and then in electric lighting at the end of the 19th century did lighting improve to a standard where one could see, you, know, you could illuminate a room. Um, otherwise, at the time um, prior to this, all, light, um, all other lighting was supplementary. It was mostly transportable. You could take the light to where you needed it. And this supplementary light to the hearth fire was initially rush lights, candles, and spouted oil lamps. And it was these that had not changed through until the late 18th century. The display and amount of lighting uh, in a domestic interior was an indication of, a, of the householder's wealth and through a means by which they could display their conspicuous consumption. So visitors and guests would notice the quality of the light fittings, the quality of the light. Um, and lighting was as important as furniture, textiles and furnishings as a way of communicating your well-being and your status. Um, what is sad, I think, is the steady, uncompromising light of electricity has robbed us all of the magic of the night, of how interiors <coughs> were transformed at night with the, by, when lit by the light of flickering flames. Candle or lamps produced a flickering light. Um, I'm not thinking paraffin lamps that had a gas lamp, Prior to that, these were naked flames, as were all lighting until the invention of electricity. So in a restless, moving light, um, interiors would appear very different to how they appeared in daylight. So um, gilding on furniture became important, not only as a signal of your well-being, but of um, the, of how it would glimmer and how the light would be reflected from it. Gilded uh, frames around portraits, textiles, um, damasks, velvets, 
would um, appear more sumptuous, jewellery would sparkle in, in the shifting light, tapestries would appear animated. And as I say, all this has been lost because we're all not lost, but we're not a, accustomed to seeing interiors like that. And in the home lit with the central heart, sorry, the, the half fire, um, pools of light would be given by candles, by oil lamps. The furthest reaches of the room would be kept in gloom. And the most one could say about that is the effect of it being darkness made visible. Um, I'll move on to the inventory. There are copies of this page for you all, if you'd like it. Um, the first... Ah, oh, where's the... Um, OK, the highlighter for... Pointer. Is there a pointer? Oh, it doesn't. Okay. You'll notice that the there is one greater hanging candlesticks, sixteen branches, um, and one lesser hanging candlestick of twelve branches. A note in brackets um, of that of the latter um, notes that the fitting was imperfect. So this might mean a candle pan or one of the the sockets might have uh, might be missing. Um, it is highly likely these were the two large brass branches that were that were recorded by Broomfield in 1750. However, um, in the Ackerman uh, in view of the interior in 1815, the um, the the um, candle branches were are not are not there. Um, the greater chandelier that has sixteen branches. This is a, a chandelier of sixteen branches. So this is um, highly likely to have been the design of the chandelier that was in the. the Chapel. Um, it may have been it may have been donated, and on this type of chandelier, the donor who wanted to advertise how kind they were would have their name engraved on that great brass ball. You, you often see that. The smaller of the branches was twelve had twelve branches. And this also has 12 branches. And as you can see, both of them have been arranged in three tiers. This, this was quite common. The term chandelier did not become usual until around the mid 18th century. And unfortunately, the word chandeliers become synonymous with cut glass chandeliers. It, um, in fact, it meant a hanging, a suspended, multi-branched fitting. Um, so the su suspended chandeliers were in, uh, um, in prior to the mid 18th century were described in inventories as candlesticks, as they are in the um, the inventory in Peterhouse, or as branches. Um, and this could also apply to sconces. What you'll notice is um, the, the, the baluster body, the, uh, the, the, the ball at the bottom, the branches, are all kept highly polished. This was important because they acted as a reflector of light. The um, 16 branch candelabra, the largest of the one, in the St. P in the chapel, would have given a light equivalent to about to 16 candle power, which is equivalent 
to about 25 watts. Um, and that would have been perceived as a, you know, an array of light. Um, Dr. Adamson yesterday noted that um, Wren had given um, a, silver um, a silver gilt fitting that was described as branches. And it would be interesting to know how many branches this comprised of. Um, in the, um, as the inventory continued, we can, there were 18 little brass candlesticks and their savals for the fellows. Um, and um, in addition, we recorded four little brass candlesticks for the bachelors and four wooden candlesticks for the softies. Um, one of which was described as imperfect. These fittings may have looked for the fellows. These might be the little brass candlesticks. Um, and another design um, here of a clustered... These, these designs are, were current in the mid-17th century, <coughs> might have appeared like that. Um, now, I've said that the little brass candlesticks and their savals, what's a savall? A savall um, is, um, had, this one here, had small pincers. And as the candle burnt down, um, the, the fat wouldn't collect the pan and the socket. You would, would use the, without wasting most of the candle fat. Candles were expensive. All forms of lighting, perhaps with the exception of rush lights, were expensive. And so wasted candle fat was a waste of money. Um, this is another example of a sable. So we know the fellows had these. And this in itself might indicate that at this period there was money was not to spare, that they needed to be frugal. Other fittings current at this time was um, this type of candle, a Heemskirk candle. And as you can see, that's got a large drip pan. And a trumpet-based candle also with a drip pan. These would, to my mind, would perhaps be too frivolous for the fellows in the chapel. So uh, this is more for the domestic use. Um, surprisingly, in this, in this inventory of 1659, altar candlesticks are not recorded. Now, uh, neither is um, the Wren donation of the silver gilt. Um, this might be because plate was kept, was sometimes recorded in a separate in inventory. We don't, I don't know, but there, there's certainly that silver gilt fitting is not in that, not in this inventory. Um, if the chapel, let's say, is to be restored to how it may have been lit in 1800, um, the following are a couple of images of how, of the designs of that period. Oh, sorry, the altar candlesticks with the, um, with the prickets. Um, yes, these, these are common still on high altars and cathedrals, parish churches, um, is part and parcel of the altar furniture. So some 1800-type designs. Um, the Rococo and the Georgian designs have, have moved on. And this, again, this is a plain example. The Regency um, uh, designs were far more fanciful. But again, I don't think this, these would necessarily have appealed to the fellows 
um, of the college. And um, some more, and a variety of plain designs there. Um, I mentioned before that the great technological leap forward was the Argand lamp, and a pair of these in brass are in the vestibule of the St Peter's uh, Chapel, St House Chapel. And I was very pleased to see them. I'd never seen any before made of brass. They were usually of, of tollware um, or brass or more precious material. And I would say these actually do date from 1800, so I regard them as very precious. They're, they're, they are incomplete, and they don't have glass chimneys, but those um, pair of lamps each would have provided around 10 candle power each. Okay, making of candles. The top image is um, how tallow candles were made by um, dipping and by um, and through and with moulds. Beeswax um, could not. You couldn't be made in moulds because the wax stuck to the side of the moulds, whereas tallow didn't. The middle um, shows the making of tapers, which were used um, thin candles um, that were used in funerals around coffins, but mainly used in taper sticks on desks that whose use were provided apart from light was for melting sealing wax for letters, no gummed envelopes till the end of the 19th century. For centuries, the use of beeswax candles remained the prerogative of the church, royalty and nobility. For some, the bee was perceived as a messenger from paradise, bringing the gifts of honey and wax and therefore sweetness and light. Beeswax candles were suffused with religious significance as the, bee, as the candle was looked upon as the embodiment of Christ, as the light of the world. An important event in the church calendar was the 2nd of February, Candle Mass Day, when candlelit processions preceded the consecration of ecclesiastical candles that were required for the coming year. To this day, the Guild of Wax Chandlers in London provide beeswax candles for St Paul's and, and other churches for the, high, for the high altar. The best quality beeswax candles were made from bleached wax. Um, and in this process, the, ca um, the candle became white and translucent. And this is the process at the bottom there. Um, unbleached beeswax candles were cheaper. Beeswax candles were made by hand, mostly by ladling um, um, layers of the heated wax. And um, then there was a long and laborious process of um, rolling them on a hardwood surface so they could be made to a, mu a uniform size. And it looks as if that person is actually doing some kind of, of measuring. Bleach candles were virtually odourless and all beeswax candles burned slow and bright and did not deteriorate if kept in cool, dark conditions such as candle boxes and chests. Um, Beeswax candles and particularly callow, uh, tallow candles uh, were ate by vermin and loved, loved a bit of animal fat. And so because they were such expensive items, they, they were kept in, in boxes. The large beeswax candles used on church altar candlesticks were generally made with hollowed out um, um, at, the, at the base so they could be impaled on a pricket candlesticks. On the other hand, tallow candles 
which were a softer composition being made of animal fat um, and also because of a low melting point um, would would bend or would melt easily in higher temperatures and these were generally put into sockets that gave them um, more stability. Um, and in the mid 15th century, wax candles cost two shillings or more a pound, pound weight, whereas the tallow candle was about six pence a pound. In 1709, a tax was introduced on all English and imported candles, and the, at the rate um, on tallow was a one half penny to the pound, and on wax, four pence a pound. These amounts uh, were doubled in 1711. The price differential was maintained, and in catalogues such as Gamages, Army and Navy stores, beginning of the 20th century, you could see that price differential where you could still buy tallow candles and beeswax candles. Tallow candles are, this is a quote, anonymous uh, author in the 18th century, a tallow candle to be good must be half sheep's tallow and half cows. That of hogs makes them gutter, give an ill smell and a thick black smoke. So tallow has a considerably lower melting point to beeswax and to produce a good light, tallow candles needed a thick wax which, was, which required snuffing frequently to keep the flame in contact with the fat. The most expensive were made from the first skimming. These were often bleached and um, could appear to the, uh, until they were lit and to the untrained eye as beeswax candles. But as soon as they would lit, the smell would tell you what was being used. Um, this is a, a, a tallow candle from a last skimming where, as you can see, uh, bits of flesh and dead flies probably are um, in the mixture. Um, you're welcome to come and look and smell any of these things afterwards, but perhaps not before lunch. Um, so snuffing, in order to keep the flame going on a beeswax candle, they needed to be snuffed. It is likely that although um, beeswax candles were used on the altar in the Peterhouse Chapel, um, the, the fellows were using tallow. And um, so this is how, this is candle snuffing. And this is a pair of candle snuffers. Snuffing or trimming the end of the charred wick helped to prevent the candle from guttering, whereby rivulets of fat ran to waste down the side of the candle, and this also caused smoking, which already added to an unpleasant smell. Drafts, which were a common problem in many homes, that would include the chapel, um, caused candles to burn down more quickly, would gutter and to smoke. And for the consumer, any unburnt candle fat was a waste of light, and more importantly, of money. Snuffing, as opposed to extinguishing, was a skillful art that required careful attention and a practised hand. It has been estimated that the best quality can uh, tallow candles did not need snuffing for, um, for every twen for 20 minutes, whereas the cheapest um, tallow candle, if a, d a decent flame was to be maintained, would need snuffing every few minutes. Therefore, if the consumer wanted the best possible light and least smell from their tallow candles, they or their servants had to tend their candles regularly. The device for wick trimming was the scissor snuffer, um, and that was thought to have been developed in the, six, in the 16th century. As it was important 
that the charred ends did not fall into the melting fat where they could cause guttering. Snuffers were made with a box attached to the blades where the cut ends would fall. And that's, that's what these are. The, the charred ends went into that box. In 1820, it was found that a, plat a plaited wick resulted in a snuffless candle uh, as the wick bent into the flame and was fully consumed. So almost overnight, a common domestic object the scissor snuffer became obsolete. How and a problem that everyone in oh sorry, this is a pair of scissor snuffers that can be seen in a still life painting by Willem um, Hedder, and that that dates from the seventeenth century. And um, you can see it's um, Heemskirk candlestick there of a design I showed you earlier. Okay, so how getting a light. This is a, um, St. Joseph getting a light. Um, it's from a, a 15th century French altarpiece. In the days before safety matches became cheap and plentiful, getting a light could be fraught with difficulties and perils. For many, the need to have a readily available light was enough to encourage them to always have a fire burning in the hearth where a brand could be pulled from the flames. In enclosed fireplaces where coal fires were used, spills and tapers were usually kept to hand on the mantelpiece. However, when a fire was required and there wasn't a, a hearth nearby, or you were travelling, a tinderbox provided you um, with, uh, with light. But skill, care and attention were needed to do this quickly and easily. And this is somebody commenting on that in, a, in 1832. You cannot get blood out of a stone, but the stone can easily get blood of you out of you. On cold, dark, frosty mornings, when the hands are chapped, frozen and insensible, you may chance to strike the flint against your knuckles for some considerable time without discovering your mistake. The anonymous author of this booklet further comments, there, were ve there are very few housemen or housemaids who can succeed in striking a light in less than three minutes. Um, here's a detail of this altarpiece where Joseph, as you can see, is striking a light and this is how to do it in a 19th century um, engraving. And what I have here is a tinderbox. Um, that's the damper to put the flame out when you've managed to get one. The flint and the steel, which was struck downwards like that. I have none, never managed to get a spark. <laughs> I invite anyone here to try. Um, the spark would fall onto charred cloth kept here um, and then the candle would be lit. What is perhaps one of the most poignant um, things I have here is the Allies' tinderbox. Uh, you can imagine in the trenches, the wet and damp conditions there, um, matches aren't going to work. So soldiers were issued with their own tinderboxes. Um. So making a fire by striking together pyrites and flint was known in ancient times. Um, and the tinderbox, which began to be manufactured in increasing numbers during the 18th century, was a direct development from this early method of fire lighting. The popular and relatively inexpensive tin sheet canister, which is the one on the table there, um, 
had a candle socket fixed to the lid um, and the flint and the steel. Tinder was usually made from charred cloth, which could be produced at home, or an expensive alternative was amadou, which was prepared from fungus. The first practical wooden friction match was invented in 1826 by John Walker, not known for other activities, a Stockton-on-Tees chemist. In 1833, the Lucifer phosphorus match was introduced and the fumes given off in the production caused a serious and painful industrial disease of fossil jaw. Um, and that could only be prevented by good ventilation and cleanliness. These matches also had other disadvantages as they were easily ignited and were often thought to be the cause of many dangerous and fatal fires. The first commercial production of a safety match began in 1855 and were first manufactured by Bryant and May. Other types of matches, festers, were made of wax and these also came into common use at the end of the 19th century. Finally, I'm going to show you a rushlight holder and there's one on the table here. Um, I mentioned earlier that these were a common form of lighting and they're also an ancient form of domestic lighting and they were thought to have been in use in Britain before the, no before the Roman conquest. During the Middle Ages, the wealthiest families would make use of rushlights and candles in their homes. Um, and in the homes of the yeomanry and peasantry, rushlights provided additional lighting to that of the half fire. Although rushlights would not have looked out of place even in the grandest homes in the 17th century, this would not have been the case by the mid 18th century where their use would have been confined to servants' quarters. In this period, rush lights had come to be regarded as the poor man's candle because they were easy to make, cheap to buy, and of importance to the poor were not taxed. According to Gilbert White, who described the preparation of rush lights in great de detail in the Natural History of Selborne, 1789, a pound and a half of rushes will supply a family all year long. Uh, um, and he calculated there were approximately 1,600 dry rushes to the pound and that a good rush, which measured in length two feet and a half, um, burned only three minutes short of an hour. Rush nights remained in common use well into the 19th century and in some rural areas, into the 20th century. In 1880, statistical information from records revealed, quotes, there is an abundant evidence that the antiquated rushlight is still an article of domestic use. Messrs. Haynes supply between three and four tonnes annually, principally to the university towns. Oh, um, if you'd like to say come up and have a look that's a dried rush and this is a treated rush which is dragged through this um bacon or or of um tallow animal fat i think that's me done thank you Right. Um, what I'd like to comment on is two things. One is about uh, uh, joinery in the early 17th century, especially ecclesiastical joinery. Um, and Trevor Cooper, the editor of the um, uh, um, ecclesiology um, today, is here. Um, but this is an, there's an, there is a long article in, uh, is it two years ago, Trevor, about this? And I don't want to really repeat that. But if anybody does want a copy, I've brought six copies of, um, of the um, off-print, and I'm more than happy to make it available. It's on our website as well, um, and I can give after the conference, you can, you, you can get access to that. But it's about 50 pages long, but I'm not going to give you all of that. What I was actually looking at was joinery, ecclesiastical joinery in South Wiltshire, 
but there are many, many similar patterns across the country. And a number of things became apparent when I was researching this, one of which was the astonishing speed of change between 1600 and 1640, um, but especially from 1625 to 1640. And almost every church, there were seven or 8,000, was reordered in some way or another in that period, most of them between 1625 and 1640. And of course, this corresponds exactly to when Charles I went to Spain with Matthew Wren, and I'm sure there is a connection with that, not least because at that time, 90% of British import, um, exports at that time was wool, still, and there was a balancing import which was timber, largely from the Baltic and largely going through Antwerp. And I cannot believe there isn't a connection, but I'm not, a, um, I'm not sufficiently well read to check this out, between the embassy going to Spain and that relationship of the, of the timber trade that it was actually going through Antwerp. Now this is a bit of conjecture, but I'm pretty sure there is a connection with it, not least because both James I and Charles I badly depended on the taxation they could get on the exports and the imports. It was much easier to tax it at that point, and we've got the port books and we know what was going through, than it was to actually tax the population or the nobles on whose political support they depended. So there's an extraordinary consistency with the economics, as well with the reordering of all those particular churches. And one of the things that I've identified in the article is there's 80% um, uh, of the timber comes from, uh, comes from Poland, um, from Gdansk, um, or Danzig as it was then, and it was being f um, f float, um, it was floated down the Vistula to Gdansk, where it was converted into pre-prepared panels, like going to B&Q and buying your tongue and groove um, matchboarding, and you'd, you'd buy all your wainscot, you'd buy your trenched um, uh, rails and styles, and that's one of the reasons why there was a hell of a lot of joineries extraordinarily cons consistent across the country. But it's not just across this country, it's across most of Northern Europe, and even into America. And I've actually found the tool marks and the patterns by individual craftsmen who clearly went over to America in the 1620s and 1630s. And they're, I, I, um, um, quite astonishingly, um, to see exactly the same kind of setting out techniques, it's absolutely the same individuals. Because Snug the Joiner, and we're talking Snug the Joiner here, was that generation. Now, in the context of Peterhouse, this is particularly interesting because I don't know much about Ashley, but what it is absolutely clear um, is that the, most of the reordering of ecclesiastical joinery at that time follows a certain set pattern. Then the pattern books of um, Friedman de Vries and um, Serlio and others, Serso um, um, and Vitalin, they, they are clearly, the, the, all the prints are produced in vast quantities and they certainly are available to Snug and his contemporaries. Um, but what is extraordinary about Peterhouse is it doesn't follow any of that. It is unique in my experience um, because one of the things about it is that it's, it's not actually very high standard joinery. In the 1570s, when the Huguenots were, uh, were coming over, the standard of joinery in this country went up ex um, extraordinarily quickly, all those big Elizabethan and early Jacobean houses. You know, you would just have to think of Longleat or Montacute or some of those big um, prodigy houses. But things start to go downhill between 1600 and 1640. And the, one of the reasons I'm sure is to do was the waning power of the guilds. James I was rushing off, selling off um, uh, charters to all the guilds, not just to the big livery companies in London, like the joiners or the carpenters and the sealers and so on, but also to the regional guilds too. And I happen to look very in some detail about Salisbury, and I'm sure it would probably be the case in East Anglia as well. But what ended up by happening, because they were selling charters and selling charters was, was good for trade, um, was that they then merged the old demarcation lines between carpenters, turners, carvers, inlayers, and joiners. And by about 1617, 1620, all the regional guilds are suddenly able to do all of those things. Well, the net result, of course, is the standards start to drop. 
Um, and there's no question that there is a fall off of joinery standards um, in, in that period, 1600 to 1640. It all comes to a complete end um, when, when the Civil War um, breaks open. Now, the, the other thing is that workshops, joiners' workshops, tended to be static. Um, I don't know about what actually happened in the Pern Library. It's interesting, the Pern Library is much higher standard of joinery than the chapel. And I don't know if that's because Ashley was, was getting better at it, but it, there is no doubt that the Pern is lovely um, and the detailing is, is, is excellent. I'm sure his carver was not him, by the way. I'm sure that was, that was an itinerant carver. It feels much more much more um, European um, than English on that. But uh, the way that joiners' workshops work, they tend to have somewhere between four and ten people. They tend to be bench-bound. You know, it's a relatively small workshop. And when I was growing up in the Salisbury area, there were still people around like that. They may have had the odd machine or two, but actually it was all much the same. Wainscot was produced um, as, as loose panels. With, it was dry-jointed with pegs, so it's relatively easy to disassemble in the workshop, stick it in a cart, take it to site, reassemble it, put it and, and hang it on the wall. Um, so, but then they would have had, certainly, itinerant carvers, and you will often find the same carver popping up um, in different parts of the country, as, in, as then, as now. I mean, I still use carvers today um, um, who would, would, will do other work for other people because I'm not a carver. So we've got the power of the guilds, which is changing. We've got the organisation of the workshops, which is much more uh, local market town based. Um, we've got the pre-prepared components coming in from the Baltic. And then we've got the pattern books. Now, I'm, I don't want to go on too long about this, because I know time is short. But let me just see if, is this the, the thing that I need to? I think we're having problems getting an adapter. Oh, right. Well, I've got it. I've got the adapter. Um, I'd just like to show you. Um, um, my, just some observations, it's particularly interesting at Mount Peterhouse. What can I do? No, I haven't got that one. Okay, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to waste time, because uh, there's nothing more maddening than the more, because I, I can tell you about it. The joinery at, at Peterhouse, I mean, if we go back to the shell of the building. It's the stalls round the outside, which I think are the most interesting. What is absolutely clear is they are Gothic. There's no doubt that the stalls themselves look like cathedral stalls. You are completely at, um, they'd be completely at home in one of the major cathedrals. But f on the front of them is a Doric column with an entablature. And it happens that that Doric column, or series of columns, is almost identical to the one in St. Botolph's um, uh, baptismal font um, just up the road. So there's this extraordinary mix of the joinery itself, which has um, a large panel followed, flanked by two narrow panels with a Gothic head to it. Um, but I can't help feeling that there is a message in that, um, in the joinery. I don't think there was a particularly good hand in designing it, but it was pretty clear that whoever was commissioning actually said, we want to show that we're echoing to the past as well as projecting to, um, uh, um, to the future. The front stuff, as you've seen in the Ackerman print and so on, is a later edition, and they sort of tried to cobble it together. But the, definitely the interesting, uh, the interesting woodwork is the stuff around the sides, um, apart from the stuff in the antechapel. The very interesting thing is, when Cousin became Dean of, some, uh, dean of Durham, there is that absolutely massive font cover, which I'm sure you know, um, at the, uh, towards the West End. And it's the size of a parish church. It's one of the greatest bits of joinery of the 17th century. But there, sure enough, is a set of eight Corinthian capitals, uh, Corinthian columns around what is absolutely a classical marble font with a huge Gothic superstructure going up for 60, 70 feet. I mean, it is the most extraordinary thing. So again, here, here is the hand of that, that, the particular continuity of trying to mix the classical with the Gothic. I think it's a deliberate message, and it's just very interesting to see here in Peterhouse in the 1630s how, um, how, that's going, um, how that's all coming together. Now, very quickly about the furniture and my approach to this, working with Jane Kennedy and the, and, and the rest of the team. It does seem to me that the chapel would look best 
if you took all the furniture out of the um, out of the nave, this rather do, does myself um, uh, does me out of a job. But actually, architecturally, that would look better, and we have much closer to the feel of the original of the original college. The chapel has to accommodate the choir. They have to be well lit, that's absolutely clear. And when I was here, and I did sing occasionally for Andrew McIntyre, who's here today as the organ scholar in the chapel, you were always bashing your head on, on, um, on the stalls behind. So what we want to first to do is create somewhere decent for the choir, um, and then create what we can for as many places as we can uh, for the rest of the congregation. And that comes down to space planning as much as anything else. But I think the crucial thing in any furniture that we do end up by designing is that it should be removable, quite easy. And so you would, as you might go into Ely during Lent or something and they clear the nave of chairs and it looks fantastic. It looks really good. It looks much closer back to um, how, how people um, might have imagined it. To that end, what we're going to try and do is to be able to store as much of the furniture as we can into the little voids underneath the organ underneath the organ loft, but it will be possible to actually remove all of that. Now, we've still got a bit of work to do. We've done the massing and we've worked out roughly what the footprint's got to be, and we're now going to get work into the detail. But the incorporation of the lighting is absolutely crucial as well, so that that can actually work um, and still have that sense of intimacy. And I completely pick up what Maureen was saying earlier on about um, candlelight. I went to a service in Merton um, uh, last year, um, an evening, it was, it was the All Souls um, evening, and there was all candlelight, and it was, the candles were shimmering, and all the linen fold panelling was shimmering as well. It was like a, it was like a river, it was so beautiful, um, um, and the whole chapel seemed to be, um, and it was uh, because the beeswax that was on the, um, on the wainscot, um, on the linen fold panelling, was absolutely hypnotic. So. so I hope that gives you a little bit of background, and I'm certainly happy to answer any questions later on. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I, I've been struck while sitting in the, the audience yesterday and this morning um, how much like an altar this, this table looks, complete with its rather grand altar frontal. Uh, but uh, in compliance with the rubric of the Book of Common Prayer, I shall speak from the north side of the table. Uh, um, Yesterday, uh, in particular, as John Adamson was speaking, I was mentally crossing off various notes that I've made that I'm, uh, of points that I thought would be appropriate to make uh, today. So, I can, fortunately, with lunch coming up, I can limit myself relatively well. Um, first of all, I wanted to make a, a, a few observations on uh, the treatment of the woodwork and um, potential colour changes to the woodwork. Uh, one of the things that we heard yesterday, uh, several points, was that in earlier stages, the, the woodwork in the chapel would have been much lighter than it is today. Uh, it's now stained and made rather unpleasant by sort of Victorian dark stain. Um, and that was not a feature purely of Peterhouse. Uh, you will find the, the same sort of thing uh, in a good many other churches, places of worship, chapels that you may care to visit. Um, if we think of Lincoln College Chapel, we saw a picture of that earlier on, which uh, Scott Mandelbrook put up. Uh, almost as dark today uh, as Peterhouse <coughs> Chapel is, not, not quite. Um, but interestingly, if you strip away the, the, the varnish and the layers of accretion that have gone in, in, in Lincoln, the wood that you'll find underneath there is cedar wood rather than oak. And it introduces a particular, particularly interesting concept, uh, which applies in a slightly different way uh, in uh, other places of wood not simply being a neutral material out of which you make things, but which is also part of conveying particular messages, uh, especially in a, a, in a spiritual context. Clearly in the context of Lincoln Chapel, uh, the idea of using cedar wood was intended to be a Solomonic reference, a reference to the Temple of Jerusalem, where the, the wood built there was uh, cedar from Tyre. Um, and therefore adding to the, the, the notions of the, the, the sanctity and the holiness of the place. Uh, in, the, in preparation for the, the, the consecration service, service at Lincoln, uh, workmen went round on the morning of the service to rough up the woodwork, uh, probably using dried rushes. They didn't have sandpaper. 
but would rough up the woodwork with dried rushes in order to just spread a little bit of that cedar dust and aroma uh, around the chapel as part of the preparation of the, the service of consecration. Uh, in my own uh, research, uh, currently looking at Sir Christopher Wren's restoration uh, city churches, so a generation after uh, what we're looking at here at Peterhouse, um, slightly to my surprise, there was only one of the, the, the parish churches there which contemplated using cedar wood as part of their um, uh, parish furnishing. Um, in fact, as things turned out, uh, there's a big nasty row between the, the incumbent uh, and his wardens and vestry, and, and nothing was done, and just ordinary oak was used. Nevertheless, oak itself can come in a number of different categories of quality, so, and, and we can see a continuation of the working out of notions of decorum in the choice of material used to construct uh, the, the furnishings of a church, um, ranked by their spiritual importance uh, and reflecting the spiritual setting uh, of the, the church environment. Um, one church in particular in London, St Andrew Hoburn, uh, has amongst the best of the surviving parish records, including a very thorough uh, set of uh, accounts and descriptions for the building of the new church and, and its subsequent furnishing. Uh, this is not one of the churches that was burned down during the Great Fire, but was commissioned directly to Wren. And unusually, Wren was also involved in designing the furnishings, uh, which was not the case in the vast majority of the churches. But it's very interesting looking at the specifications that the vestry gave uh, to their craftsmen, to the joiners, to the carvers, as to what materials they should use. So coming down in, uh, in order of the quality of the, wood, the woodwork, the rear adoss was required to be of right wainscot of the best and cleanest stuff. The pew fronts and pilaster cases were right wainscot of clean and well-coloured stuff, not quite the same qualities for the rear adoss. The door cases and ground floor, ground floor pew partitions and the gallery fronts were simply right wainscot and the ground floor panelling and gallery entablature were to be wainscot. Then up in the galleries, the pew benches there and the gallery and stairs panelling and the pew partitions within the galleries were not oak at all, but dry, good dram dale. Dram be being dram and the port in Norway, I think it is, uh, fr from which um, dale or pine or fir or some other type of softwood came. Um, obviously there's a slight cut difference in the coloration of those different woods, uh, so where the dram dale was used, that was then to be painted wainscot colour. So I think there are two points of interest there. One is that notion of decorum, using different qualities of wood for different aspects of the furnishings mm -hmm. of the church, but also from the fact that the dale was to be painted wainscot, uh, it increases our confidence that the rest of the woodwork was left more or less in its natural state. So at the very beginning, a very, very light aesthetic uh, to have in the, the new church. The one exception was for the, um, if you like, the, the, the principal liturgical uh, furnishings. So the Riridos, the three-decker pulpits, <laughs> and its sounding board, uh, which were the higher quality of wainscot, and which were to be treated with white spirit varnish. And the, the white spirit varnish for the day uh, was not one that would significantly change the colour of the woodwork. So it, it would maintain the lightness of colour that it had at, at its fresh state. But what it did do was to bring out and enhance the grain of the woodwork. Um, so it's quite an interesting notion that actually the fundamental mm. nature of the wood is something that you want to enhance and demonstrate and display in the context of uh, a place of worship. Um, and as I say, with the rest of the woodwork being left completely untreated. I've only glanced into the, the next generation or two of parish account books and vestry minute books, but it does seem that it was probably from early-ish in the 18th century that the colours begin to darken. Obviously the wood itself darkens naturally over a period of time. Um, left naturally to darken on its own, it can roughen up a bit, 
so as time goes on, uh, I think the, the introduction of relatively light varnishes to begin with and then darker varnishes as taste change later on are partly a question of maintaining uh, a, a, a seemly appearance to the, the, the nature of the wood. Um, so certainly I think one of the questions uh, for those working and making the decisions uh, uh, amongst the fellows and in the, uh, the fabric committee is precisely what type of treatment might be appropriate for the chapel. Uh, probably taking it right back to a natural appearance would be too stark for most tastes. So maybe there is something in between the two uh, which might be less shocking to our notions of what old woodwork looks like. And there are a number of ranges of mid-brown, if you like, that you can look at in other chapels here. Uh, some of us will be at Trinity College Chapel this evening. Uh, there is Pembroke over the road. Those are two slightly yeah, different uh, options. Right. And, uh, and Emmanuel. Yes, and Emmanuel as well. Um, and, and certainly, I think, from my point of view, uh, thinking of um, on Desert Island Discs, when the guest is asked uh, if you were to save just one disc from the waves, uh, what would that be? And I think from my point of view, if there were just to be one thing that were done in the chapel, it would be to change the colour of the woodwork and bring that to a, a much lighter tone. And I think that that better highlights the, the details of uh, the, 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 the woodwork. Uh, there's, there's not much there that's by way of good quality carving, as Luke was saying. Uh, but you can't even see the features of the dentils on the cornice and so on at the moment. They, they, they just get thoroughly obscured by the darkness of the wood and of the light. It can also, at the same time, highlight areas of conservation uh, requirements. That might be a good thing or a bad thing, because it might reveal problems that you didn't realise that you had. Uh, but it's probably better to know rather than not know. And in the process of cleaning, uh, certainly from things that I've observed in some of the uh, churches in London, um, that that process of cleaning and conservation can also help understand a lot better the, the, the history and evolution of the way that the woodwork has been put in, the way it's been maintained. It can reveal uh, different aspects of earlier decorative schemes. Um, Dr. Adamson told us yesterday uh, about the, 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 the marbling work um, on the, the, the corbels and the brackets on the ceilings and, the, and the, the beams along there being one example of that. And there's quite an, an interesting example from uh, St. Mary at Hill, uh, which is one of Wren's churches in London. Uh, it uh, survived the Blitz, but then suffered a, a, a fairly dreadful fire in 1988, uh, which resulted in the undamaged uh, joinery being removed from the church in preparation for conservation. Uh, that was in 1988, and the, the joinery, sadly, is still sitting in a barn uh, in, in Devon, but at least it's safe and dry and, and kept in relatively good conditions. But it was interesting when I visited there a couple of years ago uh, to see, in particular, where um, panelling had been taken away from around the pilasters, and where in a number of those cases uh, there had been pews that had been abutted up against the pilaster case uh, and the, the, the bench of the seating as well. And by detaching them, it suddenly revealed that they were two earlier schemes of uh, colour and varnish that had been used at previous times. Um, so it, it helps to build up our understanding uh, and our knowledge of the evolution of a, a decorative scheme uh, within the, the, the woodwork itself. The same might be true here, uh, and that there might be quite uh, nice discoveries to be made. Uh, we've also had a number of comments about how discoveries were made behind the wainscot in the Pern Library or under the floorboards or in uh, sealed chests uh, hiding in plain sight. And who knows, might there be more material hidden behind the wainscot in the chapel itself, uh, behind the stalls, for example? Um, uh, it'd be quite nice to know. Um, I should just make a, a few comments about lighting. Um, Less, I think, from a historical perspective, uh, more from the perspective uh, of what might be done uh, in the, the, the current set of proposals. Uh, I'm speaking more from a, a background being on the Diocesan Advisory Committee for London Diocese on, on, on this particular point. Um, so I'm, I'm not a lighting expert by any stretch of the imagination. Um, it's particularly interesting hearing what Maureen was saying a moment ago. Um, 
technology in modern lighting and LED lighting in particular has become remarkably sophisticated uh, and quite a lot can be achieved. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily come cheap uh, and the more adaptability you might be looking for in a lighting scheme, the more expensive that's going to, to be. Uh, and certainly one of the things I was going to suggest was to, to, to use the services of a, uh, a, a lighting consultant, which you already have done in producing the, the, the mock-ups, which you can see outside in the Lubbock room. Um, I, I think that the, the key words in modern lighting schemes are subtlety and very much less is more. Uh, it's very easy to be too bright, uh, to be too insensitive to the, the, the physical environment and the fabric of the building. Um, in London, I've, I've seen some bad schemes and uh, some extremely good ones. Uh, and I think that the key difference between them is that question of subtlety and going for less is more. My personal view, which others may disagree with, uh, is that if uplighting and spots are used without there being something which to the eye looks like a traditional lighting source, somehow that doesn't quite work and I think it changes the nature of a historic environment. Uh, I think there is something about the, the way the, the, the internal workings of the mind work uh, that needs there to be something that looks like what you know a traditional light source looks like, whether it's candlelight or the sort of brass branch that we were looking at earlier on. Uh, somehow, without that, uh, even a relatively good and restrained modern lighting system um, can, I, I, I think it gives... Um, a bit too much of a vibe of a sort of redundant church that's been converted into a wine bar. Uh, and it's something that requires quite careful. Um, it was interesting to see in the mock-ups that uh, you're already experimenting with the idea of uh, there being brass branches. I think from a stylistic and contemporary point of view, that's by far the best option to go down. Um, maintaining the sight lines, I think, would be an incredibly important thing. Uh, in particular, as you come in through the, the, the centre door of the anti-chapel, uh, when you see the Riradoss lightened <laughs> up in front of you, and, of course, the, the east window. Uh, and it would be a shame to have too large uh, a, a brass hanging in a way that might get in the way of that. I can't quite work out from the mock-ups as to how high or low uh, that's currently being looked at. And it did occur to me that maybe one alternative route... Um, apart from having one at the western end in order to provide lighting for the choir, would be to have two smaller brasses hanging uh, at the east end in order to provide lighting uh, for the, the, the sanctuary, which at the moment is extremely dark, as, as, as we saw yesterday. Um, so I think there's a, there's a need there to, to, to balance the needs of lighting between the practical ones of reading... Uh, for the dean, for the preacher, the choir and the congregation, uh, and those of lighting for atmosphere. Uh, there is plenty of room uh, above the cornices and uh, above the, the sills of the, the stalls uh, in order to hide cabling uh, and any uplights that might be put there in a way that's going to be um, unobtrusive and would not interfere with the joinery at all. Again, a personal view, but I, I sometimes think that downlighting can be more difficult to achieve successfully, partly because um, the, the lights do look quite bright in a very concentrated form. Um, that can be a problem if you have lights at the, the western end focused, for example, on the rear of uh, makes it more difficult for uh, um, the, the dean when officiating communion to have that bright light uh, coming very much uh, sort of straight at the face. Modern lighting also, of course, um, has much greater flexibility about the, the, the tone of the light, uh, the, the quality of the, the, the whiteness. Um, I haven't been into Pembroke Chapel recently, but certainly looking online at some of the photographs there, um, their, their lighting there is rather orange, uh, and you can do much better than that uh, in what I suppose in sort of Dulux terms would be an ivory white rather than a, an orange or a, uh, a brilliant white. Um, and I also wonder whether it's worth thinking about the options for lighting of the windows. 
there's the separate set of discussions about what to do with the Munich glass, um, but there are quite nice examples of glass being lit from the outside coming in and from the inside going out and having different arrangements in place at different times of day uh, and depending on whether there's a service going on. So I, I would certainly recommend visiting as many other completed projects, uh, both on lighting and on woodwork restoration. Uh, talking yesterday with Professor Holton with Saskia, uh, I, I mentioned a recent one uh, finished last year at Trinity College in Oxford. Uh, slightly different environment, the wood there is, I think it's mahogany, uh, with a, a fair amount of lime wood as well, um, but it's transformed and really opened up the quality of the carved work there, uh, and well worth going to have a look. Um, lastly, and it, it's a, an, an open question that um, a number of others have asked as well. Uh, I, I think to, to have at the back of our mind in the, all of the decision-making process that question of what are we trying to achieve by restoration? What do we mean by restoration? Are we talking about the conservation and stabilisation of what is there now? Are we looking at the reconstruction of an earlier scheme? from a different age, and if so, which age, and for what reason. Because this is a place of worship, because well, up here, the, the chapel is a place of worship, uh, and a place of worship for the living community of um, the college. Um, some of those questions then need to be thought about in, in, in that sort of context. What is the belief that we are trying to express here? Uh, what, is seen, what is being said about our belief uh, and our way of worshiping? Uh, in a way, it's a question of where are we on the scale of Matthew Wren to William Dowsing, um, or perhaps in today's terms of Little St Mary's and St Andrew the Great, though I'm not sure St Andrew the Great is quite in the William Dowsing territory, uh, but, but you know what I mean. Um, but some, some important questions uh, there, there, and I, I was very glad uh, to hear that those are being considered as well. Thank you. Thank you all very much.